1230, so I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's uh, meeting of July 14th, 2023. Um, we rescheduled this meeting from this Wednesday due to the flood, so thanks for waiting. Um, some of our staff and board members have had some displacement and are dealing with that, and um, we, we've looks like we may have lost our building. Uh, at least temporarily anyway. And so I wanted to thank everyone at the care board for helping each other out and um, Kristen Lajeunas for scrambling to find me a place to to do the hearing. Uh, we've also heard about some uh, challenges that many others have had, including Johnson Health Center, um, Jenna's Promise and Copley Hospital. And so I just wanted to express our, our thoughts are with all those folks and um, the challenges are real. Uh, we've had a lot of people ask me here at the board about volunteering um, to help, as have a lot of people across the state. And so a huge acknowledgement for all those folks who are helping their community and their coworkers and um, those trying to provide care and, and help everyone. So a tough week, um, but it's it's great to see that a lot of people are trying to make efforts to help their community, uh, given the realities of our the blow our beautiful state has taken this week. Um, we are without uh, our executive director Barrett today, so I'll uh, highlight a couple things before we get into the meat of the meeting today. Um, the first is public comments for rate review. Uh, those started on May 9th and they'll continue until July 24th. And folks can submit comments via the Green Mountain Care Board public comment page or the Healthcare Advocates website. We have two upcoming rate review hearings on Monday, July 9th. Starting at 8 a.m., we have a hearing on the rates that have been submitted. And then on Wednesday, July 19th, so the 17th and 19th, Monday and Wednesday of next week, both starting at 8 a.m. Um, we also have uh, additional public comment forum that we will host um, on Monday, July 24th at 4.30 p.m. Um, and we have one agenda item today, and that's the One Care Vermont Fiscal Year 24 Budget Guidance, which our uh, Health Policy Project Director Michelle Sawyer and Staff Attorney Russ McCracken will present. And before I turn it over to them, we'll turn to approval of the minutes from June 28th, 2023. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? I'll move approval. Second. I'll second. Any board discussion? And all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And the minutes are unanimously approved. Um, I received an update this morning from uh, Ms. Sawyer, Mr. McCracken, and um, I think we're going to focus the discussion on One Care's budget guidance to the non-executive compensation issues. And it sounds like we're still waiting for um, a couple pieces of information uh, in response to our requests. Um, and once we get those or we have the information we need, we'll we'll go back to um, that issue. Um, so for now, I'll turn it over to Ms. Sawyer and Mr. McCracken. Thank you, Chair Foster. And thank you, Julia, for driving the slides today. All right, you can go to the next slide, please. So the agenda for today um, will review the public comment received on um, the certified ACO budget guidance. We will review some proposed changes that have um, occurred since the last time we looked at this guidance. We'll touch on the executive compensation benchmarking just briefly, and then we'll get into motion options. Next slide, please. I also wanted to sneak in a timeline here. Um, so obviously we have not yet issued the ACO budget guidance. Generally, we try to do that by July 1st of each year, um, but due to the subpoena um, that has been delayed, um, but we have a potential vote slated for this meeting. So that may happen. Um, and then it is expected that One Care will submit their budget to us um, October 2nd in the fall. There will be a hearing in November, um, a staff presentation as well. 
and um, the the vote will uh, the Green Mountain Care Board will vote on the budget um, in December prior to the start of the fiscal year. Next slide, please. We received public comments from five different parties. Um, thank you all to um, thank you to all of you who submitted public comments. We really appreciate your contributions and your thoughts. Um, the topics generally covered the data analytics transition. They covered the executive compensation. Um, that some were around the subpoena itself, and others uh, discussed the number of attributed lives served compared to the One Cares budget. Next slide, please. So these are the proposed changes to the guidance since the last time the staff presented. Um, the workbook will start there. So tab 6.7, and I'll stop and say all of this is publicly available on our website should anybody like to see the, uh, what these changes, changes encompass. Um, we added in a few additional columns to collect um, salary benchmark data for each of the executive positions. And then we just made several technical edits as well to that workbook. Um, the narrative portion of the guidance, um, we started with part one, the ACO budget targets. Um, we made an edit to the budget target instructions to give some context around the purpose that these serve. Um, and I'd like to speak to that now. Um, this year, this section of the guidance has been expanded significantly. So it's important that we understand what these targets are and what they are not. Um, the intent of budget targets is to signal to the ACO as it's creating its budget for the following year, what the Green Mountain Care Board would like to see. The targets are indicators to be used by OneCare in developing and preparing its proposed budget. It is the hope that this will improve the clarity of the board's priorities uh, and reduce the amount of modification necessary to the ACO's budget after their submission. As the note on the slide says, there is no penalty if the ACO does not meet a budget target. However, they will be expected to justify why they did not meet it. The targets will assist the board in determining whether to approve or modify OneCare's proposed budget. If a budget target is met, the ACO can expect less scrutiny on that particular area of their budget. So a target, in other words, is not a mandate or binding like a budget order would be. No matter what the ACO submits in their budget, it can be modified by the board through a budget order and the inclusion of budget targets or whether or not an ACO meets those targets does not impact the board's ability to modify the budget. All right, so then also a technical change um, was was made with the language in the in many of the budget targets. We just changed the language from shall to must as shall uh, is legally more appropriate for an order. Next slide, please. Additional edits to budget targets number two, we removed the Medicare FPP target, um, recognizing that it's not within the ACO's ability to influence the achievement of that target at this time. Um, for budget target number five, we clarified the definition of PHM payment reform payments to be inclusive of FPP and bonus payments. Budget target number seven is the one which links variable compensation um, to the achievement of quality and cost metrics. And we added language there saying that at least one metric should tie back to the benchmarking report. And in number eight, we added a target for the ACO to submit a plan to the board describing how it plans to increase provider accountability for quality performance. So that wraps up the changes to the budget targets. The next section is the reporting requirements. Um, we added a sub question in section five, which is the risk model section. Um, there was a question asking the ACO to discuss program goals, strategies, opportunities, and limitations for the following. There was a list of items there, and we added one to um, improving access to behavioral health services. Next slide, please. Uh, in section six, which is the budget section, the financial section, um, we've made an addition to question seven. We're looking for an explanation of how the ACO determines that outsourced services are at fair market value. 
Also in this section, we added a question around administrative expenses. Describe the administrative expenses incurred in connection with implementing each of the population and payment reform programs, as well as data and analytics work. We added another sub, uh, sub question in section six around executive compensation. For each position, explain how salary benchmarks were determined and utilized when budgeting the base and total executive compensation. Justification for executive compensation shall include reference to an analysis of the ACO's performance. In section seven, which is the population health section, we added um, question four, a description of the impact of each population health program on containing costs, improving access to care, and or improving quality of care, citing specific and uh, measurable changes observed in these areas. And then throughout uh, the narrative, there were other minor edits made. Next slide, please. So as the discussion around executive compensation at One Care has continued, I did want to review what we do know about how these salaries are set. Um, UVM Health Network, which handles HR-related HR functions for One Care, uses a variety of third-party surveys to determine salary benchmarks, and you can see the four are listed out. Um, and it has been explained to us that the process includes comparisons to ACO executives wherever data exist. For example, if they're benchmarking One Care CEO, they have a list here of different titles that they might search for within each one of those surveys. Next slide, please. Um, we also know from the policy that they had provided with us that base salaries are targeted at the 50th percentile of the national peer group. Um, individual salaries will be administered with ranges with structured um, midpoints set at the median, and then there's a 50% spread from minimum to maximum. And then also regional data is taken into consideration when placing uh, individuals into their respective ranges. And then when it comes to performance-based variable pay, um, they are looking at the 65th percentile target um, when um, to award uh, when there have been uh, the achievement of strategic and operational objectives. Um, so the total cash compensation for the executives, they, they aim for the 65th percentile, but it may be below, at, or above, um, depending on the three items listed here the positioning of an executive salary within the appropriate salary range, the performance of the network and its affiliates, and then other criteria. Next slide, please. So that's what we knew, um, and the staff had requested some additional information and OneCare declined to share that information. So on June 28th, uh, the Green Mountain Care Board sent a subpoena directing uh, OneCare to produce all of the following documents um, relating to compensation benchmarks utilized in connection with establishing and or targeting compensation for One Care CEOs, vice presidents, and directors, all documents sufficient to identify the dollar amounts of the 50th percent for One Care CEO, VPs, and directors, all documents sufficient to identify the benchmarked percentile for total compensation for One Care CEO, VPs, and directors, and all documents relating uh, to how the award of variable compensation in 2022 was structured to achieve specific and measurable goals that support the ACO's efforts to reduce cost growth or improve the quality and overall care of enrollees and decisions to award 100% of available variable compensation for FY22 for all One Care's executives, including its CEO, vice presidents, and directors. Again, the subpoena is available on our website if you wish to review the language yourself. On July 7th, uh, the Green Mountain Care Board received Thank you, Julia. Um, several documents in response to the subpoena. Um, the submission is available on our website. Most of the submission was duplicative of materials already received from OneCare as part of the certification eligibility verification process. 
Uh, the new information include rolled up compensation data, meaning that it was rolled up into categories rather than by individual um, salary information. So instead of each vice president position being listed out, it was rolled up into a category of vice presidents. And likewise, with a director level, instead of individual director level information, it was as a group, all directors. Um, it did include the dollar amounts of the benchmarked 50th and 65th percentiles, but it lacked explanation of what the benchmark is, how it is determined, and the percentiles at which the actual salaries are set. Next slide, please. On July 11th, the Green Mountain Care Board followed up to Moncare um, that responsive documents to the subpoena need to include um, source documents and communication that show exactly what the benchmark is on the 50, uh, 50th and 65th percentile numbers. Um, it needs to include source documents and communications about the selection of the benchmark, the methodology used to develop the be benchmark, and the determination of the appropriateness of the benchmark. We're looking for source documents explaining the content of the uh, rolled up chart, um, meaning attachment A, which should include at least A, by individual position, one care executives, their base compensation, variable compensation, 50th and 65th percentile of the benchmark and actual percentile of individual compensation on the benchmark, and B, documentation sufficient to understand why the rolled up chart um, doesn't align with the base salary and variable compensation that one care provided as part of its revised budget. Also looking for documents and communications related to the discussion of awarding FY22 variable compensation to one care executives and the decision to award FY22 variable compensation at 100%. Um, at this time, we have received some um, documents from one care that came in uh, after hours last night and the staff are um, working on their analysis. Next slide, please. We did want to walk through some considerations for the board when deciding um, whether and how to cap executive compensation. These are merely areas for you to ponder on while you make your decision. Um, so the first is the affordability and administrative expenses. Um, by limiting one care's administrative expensive expenses, the board prevents these costs from being passed on to Vermonters. Um, as far as compensation as organizational performance incentive, um, by linking executive compensation to one care's organizational performance, such as you know, uh, benchmarking metrics, um, the Green Mountain Care Board can increase leadership's incentive to improve organizational performance. When it comes uh, to the ability to hire and retain staff, um, limiting executive compensation to the median for similar positions could affect the ACO's ability to hire highly qualified, experienced candidates. It could also impact staff productivity, morale, and retention, which could result in increased administrative costs related to leadership and staff transitions, as well as an increase in non-wage benefits, such as paid time off. And then there's the preservation of hierarchy of pay scale. Focusing on executive positions alone risks upsetting the hierarchy of pay scale. Either subordinates may have higher salaries than their direct supervisors or salary reductions could trickle down to mid and, and junior level staff. Just things to think about. Next slide, please. So um, we would like to present the board with a menu of options for today's potential vote. I'm going to walk through each one. The first option is to publish the FY24 One Care budget guidance with the proposed changes that we discussed earlier, um, but remove both budget targets six and seven, which are the two targets that cap executive compensation at the 50th percentile and set 40% of the variable compensation being tied to quality and cost performance, respectively. Um, by removing these targets, the board could evaluate what One Care submits in the fall with that additional context um, and more information on how 2023 performance has been to date. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the removal the, or inclusion of budget targets does not determine the board's authority to modify an ACO's budget. So number two, uh, similarly, uh, we could publish the guidance with the proposed changes, but with placeholders for budget targets six and seven. Essentially, this would allow the board, if you choose to do so, 
um, to wait for any additional information before setting budget targets associated with executive compensation. Once the board is more certain with the direction they would like to go, um, we can add these targets into their guidance before the October 1 submission date. Option number three is to publish the guidance with the proposed changes as currently drafted, um, which we will review on the next slide, um, what budget target six and seven look like. And then option number four, um, I've mocked up some alternative language that we'll see in a couple of slides that allows some more flexibility um, in these budget targets as well. So next slide, please. So option number three is the one where we um, where you could uh, vote to keep the guidance as it is currently drafted. So budget target currently reads. Uh, budget target six currently reads, the ACO shall cap the total compensation in FY24 for the ACO's executives, VP or and uh, sorry, VP level and above or director level and above at the 50th percentile of the benchmark used by the ACO to establish its executives compensation. Um, budget target seven currently reads, the ACO must structure the variable compensation of executive compensation, so, uh, variable portion of executive compensation, so that at least 40% is tied to one cares FY24 achievement of specific and measurable goals related to the ACO provider network performance and cost and quality metrics. Quality metrics must align with the ACO clinical focus areas as long as those priorities or focus areas are consistent with the APM quality framework. And at least some of the metrics include areas uh, identified in the March 2023 benchmarking report as needing improvement. That is as drafted. Um, next slide, we'll look at option four with a more flexible language. Budget target six. Um, says the ACO shall target the base compensation in FY24 for the ACO's executives, VP level and above, or director level and above, at the 50th percentile of the benchmark used by the ACO to establish its executive compensation. Variable compensation shall be targeted at the 65th percentile. One care must provide complete justification of any salaries awarded above these targets. Um, and then budget target number seven, uh, the ACO shall structure the variable proportion of executive compensation so that some portion is tied to One Care's FY24 achievement of specific and measurable goals related to performance in cost and quality metrics. Quality metrics should align with any payer program quality priorities or ACO clinical focus areas as long as those priorities or focus areas are consistent with the APM quality net, uh, framework. And at least some of the metrics include areas identified in the March 2023 benchmarking report as needing improvement. Next, uh, well, let's go back to um, back a couple of slides to the four options, and um, I, I'll hand it back over to you, Chair Foster, for any board discussion. Sure, um, and I guess I'll go first with um, a question, Ms. Sawyer. There. I didn't pull this up before the meeting. I should have checked it, but there was a letter to us about certain budget targets. Uh, I think it was received from OneCare, and they were requesting that we didn't have particular budget targets. Can you remind me which budget targets that was referring to? I would also have to pull that up to be able to speak to it. Um, if you want to give me a minute to do so, I, I certainly can. That's OK. I was looking. While you're speaking, I didn't find it. Um, we can come back to that. Okay. I guess I I would just say for myself, um, I would support um, going with option one on the list that you have and not including the budget targets as of today for six and seven. Um, other than that, I didn't have any other questions or comments, and I'll turn it over to the other board members. I can go ahead and jump in. Uh, my apologies if there is loud noises in the back, because um, as I mentioned at the top of the meeting, I have some basement deconstruction happening to get the wet stuff out. Um, I, I'm certainly fine with 
uh, the, with going with option one, um, I think getting additional information and having some more time to think about it would be helpful for me. Um, I did want to just make a note about uh, in the proposal that I had posted, which Michelle, quite frankly, had a lot of what I would call technical drafting suggestions uh, that Michelle has incorporated. The, the one substantive piece unrelated to um, these options is the suggestion to include um, a plan regarding provider accountability, because I think if, if what we're looking for is to have um, improvement in the quality uh, data in particular, that's really the work of the provider network. And so I think uh, ensuring that the accountability is consistent throughout the organization um, is necessary. Now, I don't know what that should look like, which is why I had suggested a plan. So I just wanted to add in a little note about uh, the rationale for why I suggested that. I could um, get support option one. Um, I, I agree with Robin. I think having some further information would be super helpful. I, I just want to also note, thank you, Michelle. I, I really felt like the background information as to how the budget targets um, are viewed by the board and the board's authority in and around the budget and budget targets was very helpful context. Um, but I, I agree. I think there's a lot of a lot of evolving information on this topic, and I think uh, more time to review the information and uh, that we're getting from One Care and have some strong consideration of the implications of that uh, would be helpful. So I, I could go with one, that'd be fine. May I just ask a, a clarifying question? Um, because I view one as publishing the guidance with the proposed changes, but not having any targets for six and seven for executive comp at all, and no plan to revisit those targets. I viewed option two as publish the guidance with the proposed changes, but allow for a revisitation of budgets, targets six and seven, which are related to executive comp at a future date when we get the information that we requested um, through the subpoena. So I, I just want to understand where the other board members are, because it sounds like folks are aligning around two, but I hear people saying one. So I get, I think I'm just a bit confused. I think, I think you're right, Jess. I, I didn't quite, yeah, I think I, what do you, Michelle, what do you mean when you say placeholder? Is it like an actual number or is it just sort of a blank that will fill in when we get the information. Yeah, um, Jess has the right idea. By by placeholder, I mean, I, I when we publish the guidance, there would be budget target number six, and it would say something to the effect of to be determined and issued by the Green Mountain Care Board at a later date, um, just to as a stronger signal that there will likely be guidance in these for six and seven, just not currently. I got it. So we could still go back and have nothing, which which is number one, or we could have put something in later. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Jess, I'm sorry. I, I, I meant number two. Okay. In that case, I'm supportive of option number two as well for the reasons outlined from others. I am as well. I mean, I, I I think one and two both allow the flexibility to come back and think about it. One wouldn't define specific targets, but we could have the discussion. Two would define the specific targets and have the discussion, um, which I think could be helpful. So I'd either either would be okay with me. Do we have a sense of the timeline um, for a revisitation? I suppose it depends on what we get all when we get all the information that's been requested from the subpoena. Um, is there a hard stop timeline when we must make that decision about budget targets six and seven? 
I don't believe there is a hard and set date. Um, I would ask Russ to chime in if he feels otherwise, but I don't believe there is a hard deadline. However, um, we know that the next hard deadline is October 2nd for them to submit their budget. So it, in order for them to take those targets into consideration, we would certainly want to provide those targets um, as much in advance as we could prior to that date. Thank you. Um, and Ms. Sawyer, Ms. Bowles sent around the public comment I had asked about, and it was refreshed my memory. Um, the letter was relating to the proposed budget targets that were at page seven of the draft guidance. Um, Which is all of them. Page seven Correct. contains all of them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I have nothing else on my end. If any other board members do, please go ahead. And if not, I think we can move on. Um, I see, um, Ms. Rader Wallach, you have your hand raised. I'll do the motion language and public comment. H the idea. Thanks. Um, Michelle, will you pull up the motion language? All right. Um, before we go to the motion, I will take healthcare advocate and public comment. Um, so, Mr. Fisher, I saw you here. Do you have any public comment or any comment? Yeah, I do. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Um, let me just do a sound check. Are people hearing me okay? Thank you. Um, well, we're maybe on a bit of a different page than um, clearly the majority of the board. Um, we think it's super, it's very important to be very clear with, with any regulated entity about what the rules are. And um, so uh, I suppose, you know, the questions by Member Holmes about sort of timing reflects on this. I think that that um, it's very important if the board is not going to define exactly what it's looking for here, that the board come back to it um, in a timely way so that um, one care or I'm going to just say it broad that one care can know how to um, comply, uh, know what the board is looking for. Um, you know, we stand by our public comment that we submitted on June 26, which recommended clarifying that positions should be included, what positions should be included in the executive compensation targets, called on the board to determine what benchmark to use, that should be a board decision, and to connect 100% of variable compensation to specific measurable goals rooted in quality improvement um, in population health. Um, I, I was on my way to saying that I thought that those were closest to option three, uh, or that option three was uh, would be the easiest to uh, adjust to align with what we're calling for here. Um, I suppose. Option two also does because it gives you an opportunity to come back to it, but we stand by those positions. Um, I think I have articulated and we have articulated the reasoning behind those positions well enough in the past, and I'm not going to repeat myself now. Um, other than to say that um, uh, there may be standards in the healthcare industry um, that um, that uh, current practices align with, and that it looks normal and commonplace. 
to have uh, these levels of compensation and these and, and the and the variable compensation as as has been discussed here. Um, but from our vantage point, it's uh, uh, thinking about it from the vantage point of the Vermonter who's trying to get care and trying to pay for their care. Um, it's um, it's hard to align these practices with those values, with those values of working Vermonters. And so that's what motivates us here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, does anyone else from your team have any comment or just? Uh, just OK, great. Um, I'll turn to public comment. Uh, Ms. Raider Wallach, I see your hand is raised. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as all of you know, I've had various roles in Vermont healthcare reform, uh, including working with Robin to write the statute that established this board. And that was in the context of a proposal from a governor to create a single payer system in Vermont, um, which would not have been a wholly <laughs> uh, public entity as in most countries or places where there is a uh, single payer system. It would have involved some sort of public private partnership but that did not come to fruition. The Green Mountain Care Board nonetheless came into existence and continues to exist, but it doesn't run the healthcare system in Vermont. Um, we do not have a publicly owned healthcare system. We have a privately owned healthcare system that competes in a national healthcare economy for talent. And so, when we set compensation in any component, whether it's a small little rural hospital or at the academic medical center at the or at the ACO, we are competing for talent in a national market. And that has been our singularly most challenging aspect of operations as healthcare providers in the last couple of years. How do we attract people, retain people, pay adequate compensation, and still live within the regulatory system that we are kind of uniquely subject to in Vermont. Um, there is no other regulatory scheme like this in the United States. And I fear that this has gone off the rails in terms of losing track of the purpose of the ACO, which is really to organize private healthcare providers to work better together. They're not an, uh, a government entity, but they're organized for the greater good. And somehow they become the kind of uh, uh, target as if they're doing something evil. And if you were in any other state, I think you would see that there is nobody else trying to do what one care is doing. Obviously, I'm uh, biased because I'm chair of the board and I'm part of the UVM Health Network, but I just think uh, that you've lost track of what the role of the ACO is and the role of um the board itself, it's not your role to set compensation for a private not-for-profit corporation. Uh, the Public Utility Commission does not do that for Green Mountain Power or uh, any other electric utility. And you don't set the compensation of the CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, of United Healthcare, of any other insurer in the business. And for some reason, um, you're thinking that this is a significant thing. And I would just say, like, above all, um, this is a distraction from the important work that the ACO should be doing and is trying to do to improve the quality and affordability of health care for Vermonters and to focus on this issue when there's six and a half billion dollars worth of health care expenditure that we could 
refocus for better health, better outcomes, and lower cost trends is, to me, a really sad thing. Thank you, Ms. Reader Wallach, for your comment. Um, Sharon Gutwin, I think your hand is raised. Uh, Ms. Gutwin, is your hand raised? Sorry, um, I just was saying my my lip got uh, I have a fat lip, but. I wasn't gonna, I tried to push the mic without the video, but now that you've seen my face, it's all it's all done. You see it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that um, there was a consideration I didn't hear regarding a benefit of, of capping executive compensation. And that is, I did hear it, there's a potential for decreasing morales and, and having there be a trickle down um, of, of attack of other salaries, but I do know um, that employees that don't make that level of pay or aren't rewarded for as, as much of what they do, I think it could do the opposite. I think it could be a motivator um, as they see potentially one care being more in alignment with the mission. Um, I think that the resistance that the ACO is giving to providing information and the delays um, are, are, are something to consider. Um, you know, it's pushing the vote down the road, like kicking the can down the road. It's not the board's um, fault for having to delay in this, but um, I think that's just a bad indication of, of those in leadership of the ACO. Um, and then certainly, yes, maybe, maybe we'll lose a few executives in these higher positions, but I see that as an opportunity. It might actually give uh, room for someone who clearly um, would not be working for the money. Uh, I think that what each of the salaries are getting right now is, is more than plenty uh, for a nonprofit and a nonprofit in healthcare, where we all really should be putting um, those we serve above all else. Thanks. Thank you very much for your thoughts, Ms. Gutman. Um, Ham Davis, please go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm really happy to see Anya in the game. Thank you very much. Um, uh, she says that there, you're off the rails. I don't think you're any even in sight of the rails. Here's what you really need one care Vermont for. You have to get the financing change from, from fee-for-service to capitation. You cannot do that without some kind of a gizmo to make it possible. That's what a ACOs were designed for in the National Obamacare legislation. If you, if the, well, that's what they have to do. Now, they can't do it all, and they've been blamed for all of the failures. Here's a, just a metaphor you might think about. If you want to paint a house, okay, then you really need two things. The first thing you need is scaffolding, okay, scaffolding. But if you just put up the scaffold, the house never gets painted. One care is the scaffolding. You need a painter, and the, that is the Green Mountain Care Board. And the all this stuff, I have never seen in 62 years a, a more crazy blizzard of bureaucratic stuff about do this, do that, and the other thing. You don't have, if you don't want one care, if you don't want an ACO, then say so. And the, but what you're asking it to do is just simply not possible. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Mr. Davis. And I don't see other, any other hands. Um, so I think, Michelle, uh, we can go to the um, motion language. Can I ask um, and, a quick question? Uh, yeah. Owen, before you go, um, Michelle, could you go over again the placeholder language? 
I'm assuming that's where Ellen's going. So I just wanted to be clearer on what that's actually going to say. Sure. Um, as I have it drafted, it says to be determined and issued by the Green Mountain Care Board prior to budget submission. What will be determined exactly? Um, the, the target itself. So the way I have it listed out is budget targets one through five, and then that's what number six says in brackets, and number seven says the same in brackets, and then continuing with eight and nine, just to maintain um, the numbers that we've been referring to throughout this entire process, try to keep those stable. Okay, and can you just um, go back to the slide of six and seven so I can see the full text of six and seven? So it will say the it'll so in the bracketed part it will say to be determined or it'll say at the to be determined. Just I'm sorry, I just want to make sure I understand what we're voting on. Sure, sure. Um exactly. So it's you know, budget target six in a bracket to be determined and issued by the Green Mountain Care Board prior to budget submission. And the see. same so the for whole number seven. For seven. I see. So you'll take yeah. out all of the text of six and seven and just put to be determined. Exactly. Okay. Um, so I'm, apologies, if I could just jump in. I, I think for clarity, the text that you're looking at in six would be removed and inserted would be a bracket that would say any uh, target or benchmark regarding um, a cap of total compensation to be determined and added. <clears throat> and then similarly with seven, the text you're looking at would be removed and inserted would be a bracket that says um, any target or benchmark regarding the uh, structure of variable of the variable portion of executive compensation to be determined and added. Thank you, Russ. Yeah, thank you, Russ. Okay. Um, so before you make a motion, I'll just clarify uh, where I'm at. Um, so where I'm at is I'm not ready to cap total compensation. I am in favor of clarifying the existing guidance on variable compensation. So um, if you, so I'll just, if you make the motions so that we're doing six and seven together, I'm going to vote no. If you break them up, I would vote no on six and yes on seven. So uh, breaking it up would allow me to vote for part of the motion if you're going with option two. So I just wanted to put that out there. I'm sorry, can you say that again so I make sure I got it? Yeah, I, I can actually, uh, yeah. So if the option that folks are thinking about is option two where we come back to determine the targets, then if we could vote on, um, each of the budget budget targets to be determined separately. Then what I would then I will vote yes on one and no on the other. If you combine them, I will have to vote no on both. I see. All right. Well, I think for today's purposes, would you want that to be part of today? I mean, I think it would be something that we do when we get the information. We would, I think, probably take them up six and seven separately and vote on them. But for today, it would just be that we're going to look at them when we are ready. Yes, except that um, I think for me, I think what the motion would be is that we will for sure be coming back to six, right? So I would prefer to vote no on that now, just to be clear that I'm not in favor of the cap. I see. Even, but what you know, because it, it indicates that there will be a cap, it's just not determined. Actually, may I just jump in here? I'm not sure that it does, Robin. I think it indicates that if we want to put any guardrails or specific language around total compensation, it doesn't necessarily have to be a cap. It could be a target. It could allow. I mean, I think there's a lot of language that could potentially be put forth for budget target six that doesn't necessarily um, imply it has to be a cap. At least that's the okay, way I interpret it. That's, that that wasn't what I heard Russ and Michelle saying. So that's why it'd be better to have the actual language so that we know what we're voting on. 
I think Russ, if the language were uh, to be deter if the board chooses to deter to um, target total compensation, right? Instead of cap, could you use the word target? It could be inclusive of a cap, but it's not necessarily uh, the only option there for budget target six. Would that be okay, Russ? Um, well, I think that's a question for the, the board could vote on, but the <clears throat> placeholder could say bracket any benchmark or target regarding total compensation, um, total executive compensation to be determined and issued. And, and regardless, it's a target. It's not a budget order, so it's not capping, right? This is a target. That is not actually a cap. True, but it it sets a presumption that the ACO will come in to meet the target or explain why they are not. So in my mind, it's what I would call in legal speak somewhat of a burden shifting uh, uh, a, a burden shifting type of uh, instruction in the guidance. So I, I had interpreted the motion myself as not requiring anything as to these other than that they'll be discussed and decided in the future. Um, not that it actually is signaling necessarily that there'll be a cap or a target at all, just that that was to be determined. Um, I don't know if I interpreted that wrong, but that's how I was reading it. Okay, I mean, if people if that's people's understanding, I'm fine with that. That's my understanding as that's well. So maybe the language, yeah. So if, if as long as the legal team can put, if that's all of our understandings, then I think the legal language can support the that understanding. Yeah, I think Member Lund, your concern is you don't want a target or a cap, and so you're concerned that by voting for this, this would lock in a vote that there's going to be some sort of target or cap. And I don't I don't interpret that way. I think there can be discussions and there should be discussions around no cap or no target or what that, that should be. That's how I am viewing this. OK, yeah, I guess that's great. why I guess that's why I viewed option one and option two similarly and that option one. We would always have the option to go back and give additional targets if needed and we discussed that as potentially being an option where option two sort of sort of specifically states that we would go back and purposefully discuss this with the option of having targets out of that discussion. So to me, the, the option one and option two aren't hugely different other than two signals a little bit more that we're going to and kind of commits us to, 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 to trying to work that out, which I think is appropriate. <clears throat> um, if it's helpful, I can read the placeholder language again as I have it. So for six, replacing the text with placeholder language that says, any benchmark or target regarding total executive compensation to be determined and issued. And then seven, any benchmark or target regarding structure variable portion of executive compensation to be determined and issued. And I think use of any in that context doesn't commit the board to having one. It says there may be one. Thank you, Russ. And, and Russ, just to clarify, the way you have option seven written, uh, sorry, a uh, target seven written within option two, um, are you finding that the only thing that we would be discussing there is the proportion that would be related to specific uh, targets. I'm sorry, I don't have the language in front of me. Um, yeah, sorry, Julia, if you could flip back to the, um, I think it's the next slide. Yeah. Uh, so the placeholder language as I saw it was uh, any benchmark or target regarding the structure of the variable portion of executive compensation to be determined and issued. And in structure, um, I think that captures both the 
what's listed here is 40% and then what it's tied to. Okay, thanks. Okay, is everyone ready for the motion? Is that? All right. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Mr. McCracken. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt again. I um, I just wanted to clarify that the motion language here, um, it covers the entirety of the guidance, including the final changes, which are around the targets number six and seven, but it's a motion to approve all of the one care guidance, which is, um, as you know, a lot more than just those two particular targets. So um, I was gonna make a process suggestion that if the board takes this up as a motion, that there be an uh, option for um, discussion, public comment, and anything further before, uh, before the vote, because the scope of it is broader than just the executive compensation portion. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I understood it was a lot broader, and I and I, the focus of it was actually not executive compensation today. Um, but I'm happy to open up public comment on that again. Um, so I'll make the motion, and then we can do that. So I move to approve the One Care Fiscal Year 24 budget guidance as presented by staff, with option number two regarding the executive compensation targets. I will second. Okay. And I'll just note that I omitted the bracketed because I don't think there were additional changes that were made to the garden guidance writ large. Um, so I'll turn it to public comment as to the motion and the, the broader guidance beyond the executive compensation, if there is any. Um, Ms. Rader Walk, I see your hands are raised. I'll just reiterate um, this is not a, a public health care system like you might have in the United Kingdom or Canada or any other place that we might hope to be in. This is a private health care system run by private organizations largely. And um, you're trying to regulate one. And I hope you'll pay attention to uh, the implications in a national healthcare economy. Thank you. And Ms. Gutwin? Yeah, just quickly, uh, I know that there's other ACOs um, in our nation, and I know that they're doing better. So I applaud the board for doing due diligence to do whatever they can to make this succeed. And the other thing is, I don't like hearing that there's kind of already one vote to never cap when there really is yet to have information to base that vote on. I think as a person you know, that makes decisions herself, I like to base it you know, on data and on facts, on history. Um, and it's not like it can't ever change, but right now we're looking at, I think, a pretty challenging situation with the ACO as it is, and executive compensation should be incentivizing success, and it hasn't, so that's all. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay. Is there any other board discussion on the motion, or are we prepared to vote? Right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And the motion carries. Um, I don't know how to properly thank you, uh, Ms. Sawyer and Mr. McCracken, for all your work on all this, um, but thank you. I hope you guys have a great afternoon and thanks for doing this for us. Um, just uh, seeing what else we have on the agenda today. That looks like nothing else. Um, so I'll ask if there's any other old business or new business to come before the board. 
Okay, and is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, and um, have a good afternoon.